Uh, so yeah, this is uh, the end of the actual book. Uh, I'm going to present chapters 12 and 13 this week. Um, that wraps up the book. Next week, we're going to go through the targets package, and then that'll be the end of the club. Um, so for this week, we're looking first at chapter 12 about reading the source. Um, <laughs> the actual book is really uh, light in both of these uh, chapters. There's just a few tips in chapter 12 and then chapter 13 is just like some notes. Um, and so I expanded this a lot <laughs> myself for what this should be about. So um, first I'm gonna kind of remind us of some steps to troubleshoot before we Google. Um, I'm gonna try to help um, get better at Googling, help help everyone get better at Googling uh, in order to find things um, that are helpful. Uh, we're gonna do some searching of uh, GitHub for our, re our related code and issues. Um, we're gonna search CRAN package mirror on GitHub. Um, we're going to navigate directly to package web pages and repositories using use this, and we're gonna um, navigate code in our studio. So, all right, what does all that mean? Um, the first thing is something that we talked about uh, in, I don't know, chapter two or something. Restart R often. Uh, that's a good tip for if something doesn't work, try restarting R um, because you might not get the same error. It might be something that you just had a weird state. You started in the middle of a project and you had had the same variable name was used for something else, things like that. So it's a, usually a good idea, idea, especially before you like report a bug or anything like that, uh, restart R. Um, and then another thing that can help you avoid a lot of like path errors and that kind of thing, again, like we've talked about before, is to use our studio projects so that you're always working uh, relative to a root directory. So just wanted to bring those up uh, before we start digging in. Um, the next part is they talk about uh, looking at Stack Overflow and um, it was the RStudio community at the time, now it's Posit community. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Chrome search engines in a second. And But obviously the first thing I need to point out is you know, R4DS online learning community. It's a great place to come if you uh, need help debugging something. So, uh, you know, if you're not already uh, here, there's a link in the description or r4ds.io slash join. Um, but I also explicitly pulled out the R tag on uh, Stack Overflow, you can put this R there. And then if you search for, um, you know, like join, it's gonna look for things that are tagged as uh, the R language, not just any join info. So R in brackets, um, which is really useful to get more specific uh, examples in Stack Overflow. Um, Posit community also has this advanced search form. And so you can look at things like uh, categories or tags um, there. So if you can you know, narrow it down, you might be able to uh, find help better that way. Uh, you might also want to look at um, not posted by so much as um, like dates when things were posted or uh, they're open or uh, <clears throat> they have, you know, they're solved, things like that. All right. So I mentioned Chrome search engines. This is a thing that I picked up, uh, I don't know, at some point in the past of using Chrome and Firefox actually. And it's super useful. If you right click on your status bar, there's this manage search and site, manage search engines and site search. Um, I'm going to use screenshots just to because I'm gonna, it goes into settings and it's possible that we would see something that I don't wanna see. So um, just click that. Um, Firefox has something similar. Uh, I think it's called keywords. I haven't used Firefox in a million years, but um, that would be the idea there. Uh, so you go to that and then down here, there's there'll be an add button. So you'll have, you know, whatever you have set up as search engines, but there's an add button. And then when you click that, you get this edit search engine where you can give it a name 
like Stack Overflow R tag, a shortcut. So just SOR, which would be the thing you type. And then the URL where you just put percent %s in for the part that you um, want to vary. So I'm gonna jump back. We go to, should have left that window open. You know, like if we look at, if I search for our join, you can see that join is the part that's unique on the end of that URL. And so let's uh, allow you to see kind of both. So all of that plus before, or all the stuff before percent %s is equivalent to this URL before the word join. Um, and so once you save that, you can type SOR at the search and uh, you get this object of type closure is not, or not, you don't get that. You um, get this search engine. So I can do SOR, whatever. And it's now searching for R tag, whatever on Stack Overflow. Um, I do a fair number of those where you can just set up keywords like that and it allows you to search faster. So for example, um, I have CRAN and then you can type something and it'll load the CRAN package web page for that. It's just this with a percent %s after package. Um, but those are uh, a useful a useful thing to know how to set up. Um, yeah. So any thoughts on that, uh, Federica? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's <laughs> <great>. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. I, when I saw uh, what this was about, you know, obviously this isn't actually mentioned in the book, but it gets close to it. And I was like, oh, no, that's a thing. I, I, I have expertise here. You can actually get really fancy. You can do like JavaScript and do um, like you can make it uh, work for multiple um, tags. I wonder if I still have this. Yeah. So uh, I think this will still work. Uh, nope, nope, it doesn't. So my JavaScript ones don't work anymore. But you can, um, we'll go into that on the Slack if anyone wants to help me debug why it doesn't work and uh, make the fancy ones work. All right. Um, so there's this project called Metacran. Um, it's called various things, depending on which website you're looking at. But all of CRAN is, all, all of the GitHub repositories associated with CRAN are mirrored in this CRAN organization on GitHub. So, you know, if you go here, um, that says Metacran, an unofficial read-only mirror of all CRAN R packages. So it's like all of the source code for every package. And if you search for, you know, let's try, let's say you're trying to see things that use the new join by in a re relatively recent version of uh, dplyr. Uh, it's going to say, oh, there's 16 pieces of code that are referencing that. And so you can see like the actual code where people use it. It'll do a search for that. Um, something, let's see. So, uh, GitHub has documentation on fancy things that you can do with that. But also notice that, you know, you can have this, uh, this has this uh, query component org is CRAN. And so we can set up a search um, engine where uh, org is CRAN. I, um, I think I did, what did I do? CRAN GH? Yeah. So search CRAN on GitHub, I set up. And now I can say, uh, like join by oops, is exactly what I did. And it puts that join by into the search with the org. I actually should set it up. I think I will to automatically go to the code section and type equals code. Um, again, I don't want to open settings in case anything weird comes up, but um, that would be a good thing to do because this is the tab you most likely want in this particular search. Um, and you can just do that, like it would be, uh, you know, just replace the join by piece with percent %s, but then you would have that end type equals code at the end of it. Um, and again, that is super useful if you're trying to work with something and you just can't figure out why doesn't this work for me? Sure, you know, have a, has anyone else used this in a package? Um, have the tidyverse people used it? Uh, that can be really useful. And so that's relatedly, um, you know, let's say you want to see 
uh, tidyverse specific versions of that. Um, oops, what was the URL? Oops. So yeah, if I can just replace CRAN with tidyverse, and um, it's using join by, and the type is code. And now this is places where various tidyverse packages or tidyverse sites um, have referenced that. Now, obviously, dplyr has lots of examples of it, but there can be other ones as well. Um, and here, you'll actually get like commits and issues because what I'm going to say here, the mirror doesn't mirror the issues of the other repositories because that would make things weird and broken. Um, so uh, the next step is let's say uh, you're working with something and you're like, I'm getting a bug when I use this the way it says to use it in the help. For example, you might run the uh, samples that are in the examples that are in the help. You can use browse package from use this. Uh, so if you type, you know, browse package, quote, dplyr, that'll give you a menu of, do you want to go to the GitHub? Do you want to go to the issue page? Do you want to go to the um, uh, package down for this web or for this package? And it's just depending on what they have configured in their description when you installed the package. And it lets you quickly go to like, the sites for that package. Um, something that can be really useful there. So let's say we were in, well, let's test that not or yeah, that's uh, if we're in dplyr. Um, I, uh, you know, again, let's say we're having an issue with joined by and you search the issues and, you know, whatever, there are some issues, but you're not seeing the thing that you're having a problem with. Something to check is look at the closed issues because maybe the issue you're having has already been fixed. And so look for issues that are closed and see if there's anything, you know, oh yeah, I was having a problem with intervals and joins. Um, and here they're saying that they're not going to fix that. So um, that, you know, don't re-report it. Um, there might be other ones um, that uh, I should have had some of these planned out, um, but there might be other things that are fixed already. So that's, you know, it's a useful way to find if someone has that thing that you're, that problem you're having and they've already dealt with it. You can also uh, check pull requests for whatever you're looking at. And so you can see there are these closed pull requests. Uh, this is where they actually added join by. Um, uh, or I guess it's before that they added it. Um, and then the other place to check within a repository is news. Uh, because if they've merged in whatever you, you're working on or whatever you're looking for, it'll be uh, up here in the development version. And so you might see, oh, yeah, this problem I'm having has already been fixed and it's probably you know on its way to CRAN or whatever. Um, and then you can install the development version if it has the fix that you need. Um, all right. Any, more, any questions on this so far? I know I'm going through really fast, but it's uh, one of these that if you need to rewatch, you can rewatch the video to pick things up. Um, yeah, that browse package, I haven't drilled it into my head yet that it exists. And I like manually uh, go to the description and find, you know, go to the search for packages and go to the website that way. But browse package often is just faster than dealing with that. So I need to get used to that. Um, but I do go to repos all the time. And so that. Speaking of going to repos, the next step is uh, often if I'm just like really trying to understand what is causing this bug, I will clone that repository. So make your own local copy of it, use this, create from GitHub, and then you can use control F, which searches within whatever file you have open, or control shift F, which will search the entire um, project uh, to, to find uh, you know, instances of whatever, it, like a lot of times what I'll do is I'll search for the parts of the text that clearly are like hard coded into the error message. And that way you can find the error message that you're getting, that's getting triggered. Um, you can also within your code hit F2 and it'll navigate, like normally that would navigate to, or, or it would load the definition that's like, um, loaded into R, your R session. But if you're working within the actual package repository, it'll go to the file 
where the function is defined. And that can be useful because you might see uh, comments in the code or things near that in the code that um, help you idea or figure out what's going wrong. Um, if you're working on your own package, just F2 is always useful to have handy because you can uh, jump around within your source code really easily. All right, I think that is everything I had in this. Is that, yeah, so that's chapter 12. I know that was really fast, um, but I'm hoping that the uh, search keyword thing comes in helpful for you. Anything before I move on to 13? Yeah, no, no, that's okay. So <laughs> just the F2 doesn't work on my uh, Mac, I don't know why. So, um, so it, sh it should be like, if, um, let me see. I will show you what I mean in a sec. Let's do, that's a bad example because that is something that is imported. If I do my favorite that I've been doing. Okay, yes. So if I do, uh, nothing private is there. So I'm going to change what I'm sharing um, to that. Okay, so in theory, you should see my R Studio, And so it'd be um, like there. If you want to be in the have your cursor in the function and when you hit F2, it should load it. Or um, let's see, let's go to this Slack posts thing that I'm working on. And if we go to, um, let's see. Uh, if we, oh, that's something you probably have to load the package to get it to uh, recognize the things. And then I'm trying to remember. So there's like chat delete, okay. And if we F2 that, now it loads the actual chat.r file and it finds the definition for that function um, because I have the package loaded. I can't remember, I should have, let's see, let's find out because we can control shift F10, unload the package. And if I, uh, let's see, I close this and it still works. So you don't need to load the package before you do that. As long as it's the package that you are working in, it'll go find it. And again, if it's not the package you're working in, so you know, if I'm trying to do this join by, it loads this definition of it, but it's not the like the source version. It's just uh, what it is. You know, it's uh, what would print if you just uh, called it like this. Um, it's the same idea as that. It's the the source code um, as R sees it. Did it? Were you able to get it working or no? No? Hmm. Not in my Mac. Maybe in my... I, I mean, I learned it from someone who uses Mac. So it's not a PC Mac thing. It could be a version thing, I guess. Or it could be that something is capturing the F2, something else you have running, maybe. Um, okay, okay. Oops. Okay. Ah, okay, yes, yes. Uh, it was that? I need to press the function. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yep. Yeah, that's a, a laptop thing sometimes, so. But yes, so function F2 in that case. Um, that I use all the time when I'm working on a package, especially because you can hop between definitions, you know, like this function is calling this other function. Um, it just makes it really easy to navigate that way. Uh, when you do that, you look at this. So um, I'm trying to think if I have a good example here. This isn't a package that I wrote originally, so it doesn't have my some of my styling things. But um, like if I go to, uh, let's do this. So if I F2 to go to that, and then F2 to that, see, I've got this arrow here, and that'll go back to where I was when I clicked it. Um, if I go back again, it like it gets confused if I've changed windows a lot. But if you're like kind of navigating through it, it's okay, F2 on that. And then I F2 use method, and it loads the definition of use method. And I'm like, oh, okay, I don't want that. I want to go back to where I loaded that from. Um, I can also go forward. So those arrows are really helpful for 
um, moving around in the in the code as well. And it's all it's you know relative. The arrows are relative to where you were just before this. It's not like any uh, semantic definition within the code or anything like that. But relative to where you were, let's get rid of that. Um, yeah, so I think that's all the code navigation stuff. It's just a couple of tips, like the F2 one. Again, I use that all the time. Control Shift F actually, um, you know, there's Control F is the file you're working in. Control Shift F is the entire project. That can be super useful for uh, navigating or even like finding and replacing. Um, and then the, uh, you know, the keywords uh, and searching within an org. There's a, all kinds of other rules about document um about searching on github but the big one that i really like is using the organization uh so that you can search within tidyverse or within this cran org or wherever you're looking to find other examples that are related all right so now uh the only other thing i have is all right we've got chapter 13 reproduce the prop or reproduce the problem um are two things that we're going to look at are using reprex to share reproducible examples. And uh, I brought in kind of on top of that, the concept of using rubber ducking to help with troubleshooting. Actually, this was inspired by a presentation that was linked from um, one of the workshop presentations, but uh, it's a good technique. So I'm gonna talk about it in a second. Um, so first, reprex. Um, that stands for reproducible examples. And I'm saying reprex, although uh, I've heard it both ways now. I, I always used to say reprex, and then someone told me reprex, and I started saying reprex, but now I'm not sure anymore. Whatever. Reprex, reprex. That general idea, that's a concept that is used throughout programming. Um, if you post something on um, uh, Stack Overflow, you're probably going to get a comment about, hey, can you post a reproducible example? If you post it on um, our, our, on R4DS, we usually ask you to produce a reproducible example. But the package reprex, as far as I know, and as far as Hadley knew when he gave, or he uh, introduced Jenny talking about it a couple of years ago, it's unique. It's a thing that R has that most most or all other package or other programming languages don't have. And it's this package to help you um, share your code. So it's to help you ask questions. Um, it's uh, uh, the perp the idea of a reprex in general is to cut out as much as you can of your code and still get the error. So enough that you can like share it. Here's what I'm doing. And this line of code is causing an error and I don't understand why, or I, I think it's a bug, or can you help me uh, you know, figure out what's happening? The thing that the package does that's helpful is it helps you find, uh, um, you know, no, that code that you just copied won't run for anyone other than you. It's using something that's in your environment or something like that. And so it'll uh, help you like trace down, oh, okay, I've got a, make sure I share some data or I have to library this package, um, things like that. Um, the reason producing reprexes is so useful is I would say most of the time, if you take the time to produce a reprex, you will fix the error because cutting things out and you know making sure that it's not something weird set in your environment and things like that, I mean, that's what the errors are most of the time. It's something you have, you know you have a typo or you have something set set weird, um, and even like it won't necessarily help you find the typo. But in looking at it that close, you'll realize, oh, that line has a typo in it. That's why it's not working. Um, and so I, I just find that really useful. Kind of imagine that you're gonna ask the question, and a lot of times that'll solve the answer or solve it. Uh, as of um, actually, it's been a while now, but Reprex has these uh, flavors. Reprex star that pr produce a reprex specifically for different things, uh, including they have reprex slack. Um, I am just digging into, uh, I helped, well, I didn't actually help with this one that much, but Yanni CD, uh, Jonathan CD, uh, who's active on our slack, uh, produces or produced this slack reprex package a couple years ago. And he has his own version 
of he uses reprex, but then he does a bunch of other calls to make it nicely formatted for Slack and he'll actually post it directly to Slack. Uh, so coming very soon, uh, the Slack reprex package, and actually I'll put the um, link to that in the chat. Uh, that will be what I would recommend for, oops, I can get this, for how to find this. Um, because it does, it, it allows you to post it directly and we're gonna have um, like the, the nice formatting and like some nice guides on how to use it specifically with Slack. Uh, it also does um, like, uh, 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 it, it lets you put in the session info really easily so that you can show uh, what's going on with your pers uh, personal session, things like that. But um, reprex in general, very nice. Post to Slack, or you can post directly, or create, it doesn't post directly to Slack, but it can create a version that will post nicely to Slack or to GitHub or to Stack Overflow or different things like that. Um, puts you on your clipboard. It makes your life really, or relatively easy. Uh, to ask questions nicely. Um, but, oh, go ahead. That's interesting, but um, is that, with the updates, you can do that as well. So you choose the location yeah. that you propose to here. Yeah, yes, uh, yes. So you can do it with the add-in. Um, and honestly, you know, I don't type uh, reprex. Very often, I, you know, you use the render or you can use, um, yeah. So all of these are just things that it's calling that are, you know, these are, or these each have their own function, which is just a little bit of a um, helper for how to render it. Um, and that append session info that's built in as well. So yeah, all of that is um, right. <laughs> like you probably want to use the add-in to do this. Um, the idea would be first you you know create the code and put it either on the uh, clipboard or like uh, select it. I should probably hop over to this is a good. Oh, I closed all those windows. Darn it. Um, yeah. So let's see. Save this. I can have it selected or I can copy it and we can go to uh, uh, reprex select or that's not what I wanted to do. I want to do reprex report or render reprex. Um, render reprex gives you the interactive shiny uh, add-in to, you know, you can say current selection, current file, another file, whatever, and you can render it for specific purposes. So let's say Slack and render. And uh, you will notice, um, I'm not sure what the interrupt is about there. Uh, that's interesting. Um, there isn't that much difference for the most part. Like most things except markdown now and so the rendering has gotten simpler and simpler because you're just gonna do markdown if you look at what it copied into the clipboard it just did the triple tick which is uh this thing is going to be code um it shows you the warning that uh will be included you know whatever output that you have so that's what it's what it generated for you is this block that you can then just you know literally Control V or uh, Command V into Slack into a Slack message, um, and it includes your code that way. Um, and like I said, the the package there, the added thing is once you have that set up, you can say, you know, you can like go directly into a Slack. Like it'll it'll actually post your message. Um, so coming soon to. Uh, to a shiny dashboard near you, probably. All right, so the other piece that I have um, is this concept of rubber ducking. And it it's similar, like Reprex serves a similar function that often if you describe the problem to someone, just describing it will help you find the error. And something that is, has been you know, shown recently, or at least, it's been, become popular relatively recently is the someone you tell it to doesn't have to actually exist. So the term became rubber ducking is people have a rubber duck sitting on their desk that they describe problems to and describing the problem to that duck often will help you find the, your errors. And 
Um, another one that I've actually been doing, and you know, it's a lot of people do. Um, like a lot of people use Chat GPT to generate code, and it's okay at that. But I find it's uh, really good at. I give it some code. Like you don't want to do that with anything that's proprietary, but if it's open source code, you give it the code, um, and like ask it to explain the code to you. And if it can't do it, then you probably have problems with your code. Like you need to put more comments in, or you need to name things better, or things like that. And so I use it um, kind of as someone to interact with to make sure my code makes sense. Uh, but yeah, literally just, you know, you can talk to nobody and it often helps you find the problem. Just uh, like uh, my spouse and I will describe problems to one another every once in a while in things that we don't work on. It's like, I don't, I don't know the actual answer, but I will listen to you uh, describe how to do the thing and then go, oh, or then you'll go, oh, I see what to do. So, um, so yeah, that's, uh, that is those two chapters in 30, about 30 minutes. Um, any thoughts, comments, questions? Um, uh, that's okay. So just this rubber duck, what is it? <laughs> oh, um, it's like, it's a little toy, like a uh, um, literal, uh, or like, you know, a little. Um, uh, yes, yes, the, 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 the yeah. toy, yes. Okay. So yeah, that's it. It's just like literally describe it to, um, Ah, okay. You talk to Sorry, rubber duck. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then so you can like, um, I'm sure they got really popular for a while to buy rubber ducks to uh, put on your desk. But it can be anything. It can, you know, it can be a pen. <laughs> it can be nothing. Um, you could load, you know, load a rubber duck on a uh, picture on your screen, and then you'll be describing it to someone. It does actually help. That is a thing of. Uh, having a face to describe it to can be more helpful than just describing it to uh, no one at all, because there are things that happen in our brain when we see faces. So um, that's part of it, but yeah, the, the general idea is just kind of say it out loud. That's the other thing of, um, if you're going to give a talk, uh, having that rubber duck to give your talk to can be helpful for preparing and making you realize, oh, that's going to be confusing. I can tell from the blank expression on my rubber duck. Um, so that's just, I, I love that technique. It's silly, but it works. You could, you know, draw a smiley face and tape it up on your screen and use that as the person that you talk to. Um, obviously, the reason we have book clubs is it's even better to talk to an actual human. But uh, <laughs> the rubber duck is a good step. All right. Good to meet yourself. No. What yes. You, yeah. 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 Hearing it out loud, like sometimes it's just hearing the word. You go, "Oh, no, obviously." Like, um, I have had cases where I, there are two functions that have similar names, and I've been using the wrong one, even though I wrote them and I know the difference. But I've been using the wrong function, um, and just saying it out loud, I'm like, "Oh, that's, you know, that's not Refrex Slack. That's Refrex GitHub. Of course, it's not posting to Slack properly." Um, Things like that. So, yeah, just saying it out loud can often uh, find the error. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Uh, and like I said, that's actually, that is it. That's the end of the book. There is technically the search this book chapter, but we talked about that in the first session. Um, so that's it for the book. Uh, we're going to talk about targets next week, uh, assuming everything stays on track. And then this club will be over. Thank you. Uh, all right. Well, thank you. I will see you in the Slack.